Welcome everyone to Crypto Defined. My name is Kathy Chu. I'm a former Wall Street Journal and USA Today reporter. I'm your host for this interview series where we look at the innovators, the disruptors, and the skeptics of the nearly $1 trillion crypto industry. Crypto Defined is produced by TruthDAO, a new nonpartisan journalism organization within a DAO. Please visit us at truthdao.xyz. Join our Discord and Telegram communities. Today's guest is John Deaton, an attorney who represents the interests of nearly 69,000 XRP holders in a case filed by the SEC against payment network Ripple. The case is being watched closely in the crypto world as it could have implications on the SEC's efforts to classify many tokens as securities. In this case, the SEC alleges that Ripple and its executives raised $1.3 billion starting in 2013 through the sale of unregistered securities of XRP, a digital asset and cryptocurrency. XRP is a native cryptocurrency used on Ripple's blockchain for international payments and currency exchange. The case has the makings of a movie with all of its twists and turns, as John Deaton well knows. There are foreign governments involved, powerful U.S. officials, a defiant payments company, a determined lawyer in John Deaton, and his loyal army of XRP cryptocurrency users who help him track down court documents on social media. I believe we've even had references in court filings to the movie My Cousin Vinny, John, <laughs> which maybe we'll get to later into later. John follows the latest developments in the case on his website, crypto-law.us, and is highly active on Twitter at John E. Deaton, D-E-A-T-O-N-1. Thank you, John, so much for being here with us today. It's a pleasure to have you. and We have a lot to talk about. Yes, Kathy, thank you so much. But let me just say we have now 74,000 XRP holders who have joined in this fight. So it grows a little bit every day. It's amazing okay. when you think about it. 74,000. So, so, John, um, there is a lot of ground to cover. Let's let's start here. John, you've said that this is the most important thing happening in crypto today. I think you said that on Twitter um, just today. So why do you think that is? Well, it's two things. One is if you think about global trade and finance, what topic has been more relevant or discussed than digital currencies. We're talking about Bitcoin, Ethereum, XRP, all the other cryptos, central bank digital currencies. We're talking about almost every government around the world is in discussion about creating a central bank digital currency. So there's no bigger topic in global trade and finance in the world today. And this case dealing with XRP, when, when Ripple got sued, XRP was the third largest cryptocurrency in the world. And so I've said that this case is the, not only is it the biggest topic in crypto, this case is the most significant non-fraud SEC enforcement action since 1946, when the Howey decision was decided, because it's going to dictate what happens in crypto. Kathy, we're not going to get regulation from Congress any time in the next year. That's just a fact. We're in a mid election cycle and then he's going to take bipartisan effort before a bill gets passed by both houses and signed by the president. We're talking about probably 18 months. And so the decision handed down in this ripple case is really going to define really the regulatory reach of the SEC in this asset class. And that's why everyone's watching this decision so closely. So to be clear, you represent the holders of XRP, not Ripple itself. And XRP holders are not considered a party to the SEC's, SEC's lawsuit against Ripple, but have amic amicus curiae status, if I pronounce that correctly, which literally means friend of the court. So can you briefly explain, John, what that allows you to do or not do and to what extent also the status allows you to be part of the conversations 
behind the scenes with the judge and the lawyers for the SEC as well as Ripple? It's true. I don't represent Ripple. I've never spoken to Brad Garlinghouse or Chris Larson. I've, I've never met them, uh, never had a conversation with any of them. My whole focus is on the individual XRP holder and how they've been impacted uh, by this case. And so what we did is we did something that's really never been done before. I filed a, a motion to intervene where I was asking the judge. I basically said, look, the SEC that all, all XRP, no matter who sold it, no matter who bought it, all of it going back eight and a half years is all unregistered securities. And I said, so they've practically sued us without naming us. So judge, if they're going to do that, we want to be a defendant in the case so that we can represent our own interest. And the judge, understandably so, said, listen, no one's ever ran to the court and said, hey, sue us too. You know, thousands of people saying, sue us, sue us. And she said, um, I'm not going to let you do that because that's kind of crazy. But what I am going to do is I recognize your interest in this case and the fact that the SEC has charged this case in, in a very overbroad way. And I'm going to name you amicus curiae, which basically, as you said, means friend of the court. And what that means is I'm not allowed to call witnesses. If there were a trial, I'm not allowed to stand up and, you know, and argue before a jury in front of the court if it were to go that far. But she's allowing me to give her the perspective of XRP holders and why she should consider that perspective and how a ruling by her could impact us. And what I'm doing, Kathy, is I'm saying, listen, if the SEC wants to go after Ripple and claim that when Ripple sold XRP on a particular day at a particular time to a particular person or company, if you want to claim that that violated the law, go at it. Me and my friends, we've got nothing to say about that. We don't take a position. But if you're going to say that the underlying asset, XRP, is in and of itself an unregistered security, then we have to be heard. And that's what the SEC is doing. I'm sure you and your viewers have heard this case called the Howey case that involved orange groves. What the SEC is doing is basically saying that the oranges – were securities if we were to go back in 1947. XRP, a blockchain produces native cryptocurrency. XRP Ledger produces XRP, Bitcoin produces Bitcoin. Orange grows produce oranges, same kind of concept. But the Supreme Court never said the oranges were the securities. They said that the, the scheme and the contracts between the parties were. And so because the SEC has alleged this case in such this overbroad way, it has allowed us to come in and, and participate. And so I'm, I'm thankful that the judge gave us the opportunity. OK, so let's get into the meat of this case. But before we do, I saw that a lot of people have joined us on the Fireside app. Um, so let me uh, let everyone know how to ask questions. As we're talking to John, if you have a question for John, what you want to do is hit the emoji symbol at the bottom right of your screen, audience members. That's a react symbol, okay? You're going to hit an emoji and you can type a question in for John. You can raise your hand and we will probably have one or two uh, questions for John uh, from the studio audience and fireside near the end of the show. So please, as you hear something he says, if you need a clarification, feel free to type in questions for him. Okay, I'm here with John Deaton. He's the attorney for more than 74,000 XRP holders, and you're watching Crypto Defined with Kathy Chu. Okay, so let's get into it, John. So the sure. SEC, as you mentioned, has said that sales of XRP from 2013 on are considered unregistered securities, um, but didn't classify sales of Ether, for instance, as a security when Ether had its fundraising in 2014. Um, we've had SEC officials such as Wilman, William Hinman actually talk about how Ether may not be a security. And we'll talk about Hinman in a bit, but first, can you tell me how you think about this uh, issue, which is if Ether was not considered a security in 2014 with its ICO, how is XRP considered 
uh, one. I mean, what is the argument um, that the SEC is making that makes in its documents about why um, XRP could be considered one and not Ether when it had an ICO? Uh, great question. And that is the $64,000 question, right? Why was one cryptocurrency giving a regulatory free pass, if you will, but then another cryptocurrency that is arguably more decentralized, you know, we could have that debate, it's a debate, right, uh, is not. And so uh, what Bill Hinman, he said, if you look at his speech, he acknowledged that the ICO, which is an initial coin offering, that Ether, they didn't have the blockchain. They raised money as the ICO. They took that money and then they built the Ethereum blockchain. That is, by definition, a security. So in his speech, Bill Hinman said, setting aside the fundraising that occurred with Ether's creation. Those were his words. So he's acknowledging, okay, that was probably a security or it is a security. But if you set that aside, he went on to say that today's Ethereum, and this was 2018, that it was sufficiently decentralized. So therefore, there was no uh, what he called there was no third party promoter. Now, we've learned that that's not true. And I'm not picking sides. I, I can prove this unequivocally because we've learned through the discovery of this case that Bill Hinman met four to six times with the Ethereum promoters. And so he met with them between December of 2017 and June 8th of 2014, at least six times. And then he says, well, we don't recognize a promoter. So it really has raised concerns. They've never answered that question, Kathy. Your question is so good and so important. The SEC's refused to answer it. But what we're doing is we're saying, look, if Ethereum is not subject to securities regulation, XRP isn't either. And then we make those specific comparisons that Ripple only controls less than 4% of the validators on the, X, on the uh, XRP ledger, for example. And I won't get into all those details, but that's really, well, and I'm gonna address this in the amicus brief that I file, uh, how if Ether was blessed, XRP by definition had to be as well. But we're going to eventually get an answer to that question. It's just not going to be today. Okay. Now, for those uh, who may not know who William Hinman is, let, let, let's just clarify. He was the then, uh, in 2018, he was the director of the SEC's Division of Corporation Finance. And he made an important speech um, in 2018 that kind of set the tone for the debate going on today. Um, and um, led to some major developments as recently as last week. So, um, John, you had mentioned that if Ether is not security, um, then, then XRP is not either. Let me turn that on its head um, for a second, because sure. I have seen uh, some lawyers on social media um, and uh, some former SEC officials actually say, the right question to ask is not, you know, why is Ether not a not a security, uh, but XRP is. The right question to ask is, is XRP a security and Ether is a security also, but it actually hasn't been, um, the case hasn't been done yet. So in other words, you know, um, what these officials and some lawyers and supporters of the SEC had said have said is that actually all these might be securities and the SEC is just choosing to go after XRP first and then Ether is next possibly um, uh, and some of Gary Gensler's remarks uh, show that he may think that um, Ether after this move to proof of stake could be a security and then other tokens next. So how do you think about that and how do you reconcile that with what's going on right now? Great question. And, and I understand why those lawyers and people feel that way. And if we go back to Gary Gensler in 2018, when he was at MIT, he stated that he believed both Ether and XRP were securities. And, and he's recently won't commit that Ether is not a security. He said he's only comfortable saying Bitcoin is a commodity. And so a lot of people do believe, and I'm one of them, that he could go after Ether next if 
uh, the SEC is successful with XRP. But here's the reality. Uh, in order to be a security, you have to meet certain requirements, right? You have to, there are, there are basically, some say three, some say four, but there are four elements to it. There has to be an investment into a common enterprise where people are led to have an expectation of profit by that promoter. You have to have all four of those. The majority of XRP holders, and I've taken, I've gotten thousands of affidavits to support this case. I was actually going to ask you that. Have you polled, have you yes. um, polled XRP holders? Because part of the issue, right, is whether this was purchased as an investment or whether it was purchased for utility. And one of the lawyers I was talking to you pointed out, you know, unless you ask every single person, how would a federal regulator know that every single sale is considered an investment since 2013? Where is that? Where is the documentation for that? All right. Well, here's, here's an example for you, Kathy. Time Magazine accepts XRP. Time Magazine. They accept Bitcoin. They accept ETH, XRP, Dogecoin. Um, they do not accept it with the eye of investment. They then transfer it and convert it to fiat. Right. It's a business. They are a cash business for subscription. So you have there used to be a uh, an XRP tip bot on Twitter and people who provided YouTube content or X or Twitter content or coil. You would get tipped in XRP just as a tip. People get paid. I know XRP holders who are paid in XRP. In Japan, you have the esports uh, video game players from SBI sponsored and they are being paid in XRP. So those types of acquisitions of XRP by definition are not an investment. People can go on the XRP ledger and transfer tokens to another wallet. And all you have to do is acquire the minimum 10 XRP. And they do that as international traders. So uh, people that are over here and they're sending money to the Philippines or Mexico or anywhere else. And they're just using that to bypass MoneyGram and Western Union and all the fees. So there are multiple uses. The decentralized exchange that's built in the XRP ledger, the first world's decentralized exchange, people don't know that, was the XRP ledger. And you can get on there and, and transfer other types of tokens, casino coin and others, and make these transfers where XRP is used as a bridge asset. Those all do not qualify as an investment. Are there people who bought XRP as an investment? Of course, just like Bitcoin, just like Ether and everything else. But that's one reason why this, this consumptive use exempts it from being a security. Here's another thing. You're supposed to be able to rely on the efforts of Ripple. What can every XRP holder do? 55% of XRP holders, when they first bought XRP, they don't know who the heck Brad Garlinghouse is. They never heard of a company called Ripple. They may have heard of the word Ripple, but they don't know about this blockchain company that's dealing in the banking system, selling software. They don't know any of that. What they do is they take their XRP and they go to Celsius or Nexo or BlockFi and they collect interest off their token. You don't need Ripple for that. Right. So that alone is another example of how XRP, Ether, Bitcoin and all these others that have been traded for almost a decade are more akin to commodities and more akin to currencies, alternative currencies, as opposed to securities. A true security would be the Ethereum ICO. Right. Or the Telegram ICO, where there is no blockchain. You raise money through the public. And you take that money, you pull it together, and you build the technology. That is a security. And the SEC has action over that. But these existing cryptos that have been traded for a decade now, they need to go more to the CFTC. Okay. So, John, let me understand something, though. Um, is it your position that n none of these... Um, None of these sales of XRP should be considered um, an investment, or that some of them should, some of them shouldn't, and the SEC should should it should not say that from 2013 on every single 
um, sale or transaction with XRP is considered an investment. I mean, are you opposed to the agency basically parsing out, okay, in this instance, in this year, this was an investment, in this year it's not? I don't think you are opposed to that, correct? No, perfect, perfect question, Kathy. Uh, in fact, if the SEC would have done its job and done what it's supposed to do under the law and is charged transaction by transaction, this is what people don't know. Any commodity can be packaged and marketed as a security. Bitcoin is not a security, but in 2015, there was a case where someone packaged it in a certain way and it was considered a security. Not Bitcoin, but that sale and offer the way it was devised. Chinchillas have been used as a security. Beavers have been used as a security, right? Apartment condos, any asset or commodity can be packaged and marketed. So if the SEC would have said, Ripple, when you sold XRP to this person in 2014, when your ecosystem was really, really young, and there wasn't a lot of developers on the XRP ledger. We think that specific transaction was a security. Had the SEC done that, you would not be interviewing John Deaton right now. But instead, they went with this insane, Kathy, and I mean, it's insane type of argument that we're going to go back in time and say all XRP, no matter who traded it, no matter who sold it, it all is an unregistered security. I mean, what that means is saying is that when MoneyGram, which was being given XRP from Ripple, went on Coinbase and traded it on the secondary market, they're saying that what MoneyGram sold to me or someone else on Coinbase when it was listed there, that that's an unregistered security too. One of the uh, people that are on the six people that sued the SC is my daughter, Jordan Deaton. You know, Jordan, when she was turned 18 years old, she received her birthday money through all the years. She got like $15,000. And she heard her dad talk about this crazy fourth industrial revolution called crypto. And she said, you know what? I'm not going to blow the money. I'm going to buy a Bitcoin because it was trading at like 10 grand. I'm going to buy a Bitcoin and I'm going to then buy 2,500 worth of XRP and 2,500 worth of ETH because they're the top three. She never heard of Ripple. She didn't know who Brad Garninghouse is. All she did is say, hey, there's this new asset class. I'm just going to buy the top three. I don't know what's going on. Do you know how many people fit that category? And they didn't in invest in a common enterprise with a company they never heard of. And so that's the problem. If the SEC would have just stayed transaction by transaction and said, Ripple, you did some bad stuff on this day, and this is, this is what you have to defend, That'd be one thing. I'm OK with that. Whether they're successful or not, I don't know. But when you say that, you know, my daughter or uh, Tony from Thinking Crypto's mom uh, bought an unregistered security when they purchased XRP, never heard of having heard of this company. That's insane. And, and what that is, Kathy, is that SEC trying to do a land grab and trying to say we want the jurisdiction of this entire asset class. And that's really what's at play here. Okay, and uh, thanks for bringing up your daughter, John, because um, I think it's important to disclose also, uh, as you mentioned, your daughter is one of the um, uh, leads in this, in your yep. amicus story. And mm -hmm. also that you own um, XRP as well as Bitcoin. And I believe you're doing, you're representing the 74,000 XRP holders um, you're not doing it for money. No one's paying you. Um, you have an interest in the outcome of the case, correct? Absolutely. I've never received okay. a dime from it. anyone. Uh, there have been XRP holders. You know, they offered money to help me and all that. I won't take it. Uh, this all started off, Kathy, very organically. When I read the complaint and I saw how broad it was and what was going to happen, I was just upset. And I said, you know, I, I have a law degree. I want to do something about it. And I never envisioned that, you know, 18 months later, there'd be 74,000 people from 143 countries around the world saying, John, we want to join with you. We want to fight, too. And so I wouldn't take money because then it would spoil the beauty of that. You know what I mean? Of, of, of people coming together and it's it's for the right reason. And so people have offered me money, but I won't take it because I'm not going to spoil it. OK. And and uh, just uh, a note on the XRP army, um, uh, XRP supporters, 
I uh, have have not seen such, uh, I guess, dedicated following that you have here on Twitter and on social media, um, not just in the sense that they follow you, but what I found very interesting as I was doing my research is they actually find legal documents for you. <laughs> I was <laughs> reading, that. I was reading a chain of the the, the tweets, and you were asking them a question, basically crowdsourcing, crowd reporting, and yeah. about does anyone have these documents from? Singapore or, you know, other countries and people were coming up with documents for you. And, and also what surprised me about the community is, um, obviously not all of them, but some of their legal knowledge. Um, yeah. they're not lawyers, but, um, you'll see in some of the questions they were asking me to ask you very complex, you know, legal questions where they keep up on every, um, Step of the case. So I guess my question here for you very, very briefly, John, is yeah. um, what do you think that shows? I mean, people are really up in arms about this. What is the implication for XRP holders if the SEC determines that this is a security? I mean, obviously, the XRP has been dis delisted by Coinbase. Mm -hmm. And there, if those people considered an investment, their investment would be hurt, correct? But what is the, uh, is there another greater implication for XRP holders? Why are people so invested in this and so up in arms? Well, one, I, I, they, they have been fantastic. And there's this concept we've, we've called decentralized justice. And it allows me, as you said, to say, hey, I can't. I remember seeing this somewhere, and and the XRP community, I just I love them to death because you know they they go bend over backwards to help me. It really has been this collaborative effort. I always tell everyone I might be the face of the fight, but uh, I have literally seventy four thousand people you know supporting me. So they deserve uh, every bit as much credit as I do on anything. Uh, there's a lot at stake. You have people, Kathy. Um, Companies like iTrust Capital and other where you were allowed to put your your crypto into a retirement account. It's been frozen. People have not been able to access like their retirement account because they can't convert or trade their XRP. They've received these notifications. And so you're talking about people who have their life savings. And and you and I can have a debate about whether that is a good investment to have, you know, so much in one asset or a cryptocurrency. That's one argument, but that's not what's relevant. What's relevant here is that the government has gotten into the business of picking the winners from the losers. As we were talking about earlier, when Bill Hinman gets up and says, hey, forget about that ICO, it's not a security, and he's being paid by a law firm simultaneously that is a member of the Inter uh, Ethereum Enterprise Alliance, and he's collecting millions of dollars at the same time, and, and the SEC won't do anything about it. They won't even comment about it. That's what's wrong. So people are outraged. And two, it's we got to get away from this nanny state where the government is going to tell us what's good for us. People, the XRP community, as you just mentioned, these are some of the brightest people. They're very, very knowledgeable. And they've made a decision. They've done their research. And they believe this, whether they're right or wrong, right? The market should decide whether they're right or wrong. They believe that XRP is the asset to, to, uh, to invest in or believe in or hold or whatever you want to call it. And if the SEC is successful, XRP will be untradeable, right? It will, you can't trade. If it's an unregistered security and it's deemed as such, you basically, whether you have $10 invested or 10,000 or a hundred thousand, you've just lost everything. So there's a lot at stake. And, and I tell everyone, if the SEC is successful, then I guarantee you Ethereum is on the hook. I guarantee you that Algo and XLM and Cardano and all of the rest, because if XRP is deemed a security itself, then there is no distinction of the others. I mean, other than Bitcoin and other than Litecoin, maybe there may be a couple that you can that were forks from Bitcoin that you could say weren't in play. But they're all in play. I did a video a year ago that said this case, if the SEC is successful, 
every altcoin on the market will be deemed a security. So it's a lot more at stake, not just for XRP holders, it's for the entire crypto community. Okay, so just to remind our viewers, we're talking here with John Deaton. He is the attorney for about 74,000 XRP holders. Um, and he is talking about the SEC lawsuit against Ripple. If you hear something John, John said and would like to ask him a question, feel free to hit the react emoji on the bottom right of your screen and type in a question and we will get to it at the end of the show. Okay, so John, um, let's get into the latest development. Let's get into the Hinman emails, which I think is one of the trending topics now on Twitter because uh, oh. everyone is asking about it. Um, this is one of the latest developments Ripple won a motion just over a week ago, I think it was September 29th or 30th, that basically compelled the SEC to turn over emails and previous drafts of Hinman's speech all the way back from 2018. Um, if the SEC doesn't appeal, uh, which um, I suspect the SEC will appeal, but assuming the SEC doesn't appeal and is forced to hand them over, I guess my question for you is, what do you expect these emails and earlier drafts of the speech to show? Why are they important? Sure. Uh, it goes back to your original question, Kathy, at the beginning of this fireside chat. You said, well, if Ethereum was given a pass then and not a security, why wouldn't XRP? So I believe strongly three emails. There are 58 unique drafts to that speech that Hinman gave. And it went back and forth and there are comments in the emails and there's edits and suggestions. And there's a, a really strong likelihood that XRP was brought up because XRP in January of 2018 overtook Ethereum as the number two crypto. In September of 2018, XRP briefly overtook Ethereum. It was battling Ethereum for that number two spot behind Bitcoin. And everybody was wondering, what's you know, are they gonna be securities? Are they not gonna be securities? And in June 13th, 2018, no one's read it except the SEC. The SEC had a memo written and it was a memo on whether or not XRP is a security under Howey. And we don't know what it says, but we know what it doesn't say because the judge in her ruling said that there were no recommendations after at the end of that analysis. In other words, no one said, hey, XRP is definitely a security. You should sue Ripple. Ripple wasn't sued for almost another three years after that, two and a half years later, or 18 months, something like that, they were sued. Two and a half years, they were sued after that. So there's a really good chance that XRP's discussed, like someone might have said, hey, why are you giving ETH a free pass and not XRP? Don't you think XRP is just as decentralized? And there could be that kind of give and take going back. And if that's in there, that could guarantee Ripple the win, right? Because um, it, it goes to show you, because the, the, the SEC has taken this incredible position that, and, and I don't defend these guys because I don't know them, but I'm just talking about the argument. And the argument is that Brad Garlinghouse and Chris Larson should have known in 2013 that XRP was a security when the SEC analyzed it in 2018 and didn't come to that conclusion itself. And they're the experts. You could own XRP at the SEC as an enforcement lawyer all the way to 2019. So if that's possible, how are you allowed to own an unregistered security when you're an SEC enforcement lawyer? And the levels of absurdity that are involved in this case is, is really, really incredible. And that's just one of them. Well, what's the timeline for all this? Um, the, the judge has ordered the SEC to turn over the documents. Um, I believe they have 14 days to appeal. What is the ultimate timeline on this? When do they need to turn it over um, or can they just delay uh, with other motions? Well, ba basically, they, they can do more delay. I expect them to potentially file before the 14 days are up or on the 14th day from the day they were ordered. They can file what's called a motion for reconsideration. 
second bite at the apple to Judge Torres. Hey, we think you got it wrong, Judge. Will you change your mind? You can imagine that's not usually successful. Ripple then would have 14 days to give their objection to the SEC's motion for reconsideration. And then the judge would give another ruling. At that point in time, the SEC could ask the judge to certify an interlocutory appeal to the Second Circuit, which I don't think she will. And then they could file what I filed before in this case, believe it or not, it's called a writ of mandamus, where they're asking the court, the appellate court, they're saying the judge didn't do her job and you need to order her to do her job. They can exhaust all of that. And I calculate they would run out of time sometime just before the end of the year, late December. So if the SEC wants to basically pull every delay measure or lever that they can, they could probably delay it until the end of the year. In early January, they'd be forced with an order to turn them over immediately. Okay. And and just to show you um, some of the uh, legal expertise of some of your Twitter followers, that was the question from Florence Japan Lover on Twitter. She was asking, you know, basically how much time a motion for certification of an interlocutory <laughs> appeal takes and how much time a writ of mandamus takes. So you're they're answering. Fantastic. They're fantastic. They really are. Yeah. To, to Florence's question, the maximum time that they could not follow the order, assuming uh, the judge doesn't overturn the order, would be by the end of the year or early next year, they would have to turn over these documents. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Generally speaking, it, it would be it would run the clock out until just the beginning of the year. OK, so, um, John, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, one of the issues of the Hinman's speech is he prefaced it by saying that it is his personal opinion, not an official agency position. I mean, that that's very typical when SEC officials, government officials make speeches um, and, you know, uh, it's up for debate whether it actually is a personal opinion or not. But one thing I wanted to um, note is the judge who's ordering the SEC to turn over Hinman's emails and previous drafts of the speech specifically said in the ruling that I read that the reason why she's allowing it to be turned over is it's not privileged information because it's seen as a personal opinion. So I wanted to ask you, um, how do you think about this, John? In one way, it's a, considered a big win for XRP holders because you know these need to be turned over as you mentioned they could there could be some very important information in there but in another way if the judge is saying it's a personal opinion doesn't that also do harm to the idea that getting these emails would show this is not just hinman's this this is not just the sec's thinking but rather just hinman's i mean how do you think about how do you uh, mesh those two together a great, great question, Kathy. The, the answer your question directly, it doesn't matter whether it's really the effect doesn't matter whether it's personal opinion or the opinion of the Division of Corporation Finance or the SEC in general. What the court looks at, what does the reasonable market participant think? So objectively, despite an SEC person saying, oh, I got to tell you that these are just my personal opinions and not the opinions of the commission. It doesn't matter if he gets out and says, ETH is not a security. The market takes that as guidance and they take it as official guidance. So we don't look at, we don't worry about what's in Bill Hinman's mind. We, we look at what would the reasonable market participant like Ripple, like Consensus, like the Ethereum Foundation, like a hedge fund, whoever, what would they think? And it's okay and it's still acceptable to, to view it as market guidance because that's how we don't really distinguish between, oh, that's a personal opinion or that is not. Because Bill Hinman gets up and says, he goes on CNBC right after and says, we at the SEC believe, and you can look at that, he says we all the time. And so the market in the court is saying, it was guidance, even though you throw in this disclaimer. The SEC really blew this, to be honest with you. And it's because their lawyers, Kathy, are being very transactional. They're only arguing one argument at a time. So when they knew that Ripple was going to say what you said at the very beginning, well, hey, if ETH has got a free pass, we should get the same thing and we'll compare ourselves to Ethereum to prove that we're not a security. So the SEC got very defensive and said, hey, it wasn't market guidance. It was just his personal opinion. 
So then the judge relied on that. And then when she ordered it to be turned over, they said, oh, no, we changed our mind. It was the opinion of the division because he relied on other people at the SEC. And they, they played this like, you know, dance of trying to to claim it one thing, personal opinion, not personal opinion. And so that's the reason. If the SEC would have would have stated from the beginning that that this was market guidance, those Hinman emails would have never been turned over, would have never been ordered. But because they chose this litigation tactic is why it's so relevant. John, but um, is that in the legal code that it doesn't matter if it's a personal opinion or where, where, which law or which part of the legal code says that it depends on how the market participant takes it? It makes sense, but is that part of a legal statute? Well, no, what it's called is, is if you know in this case, Ripple has a defense and it's called, been labeled the fair notice defense because mm -hmm. the law says that uh, unless a person, a reasonable person knows that something's prohibited, then they're not on fair notice that their, their conduct was unlawful. And a lot of people misunderstand that. So that's all it's saying. It's saying that a reasonable person would not have known that XRP is not a security because you said ETH's not a security and here's all our similarities to ETH. That's really what it gets at. And it's basically a, a due process constitutional type of argument that you have to be put on notice of what's lawful versus unlawful. And when an, an, a high ranking government official like Bill Hinman gets up and says something, doesn't matter if he says it's his personal opinion, it matters is what does the market view that? Is it reasonable to expect it not to be? You know, okay. and so um, uh, to give you an example, there's a company called Baylord and they're just a family run office and they disclose they made a disclosure to the SEC, an ethics disclosure in 2020 and 2021 that said to the SEC, we know there's this debate about cryptocurrencies, but don't worry. We're only allowing our people to trade the three cryptos not considered securities, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and XRP. That's what I mean by a market participant. And that's an actual disclosure at the SEC that was filed before this lawsuit. Okay. Now, both sides, the SEC and Ripple, have um, filed motions for summary judgments, which I want to talk to you about in a minute. But a number of other parties have also asked the judge to file amicus briefs. Um, the SEC has objected. And I guess I wanted to ask you very quickly, why is it important um, for these amicus briefs to be heard? I mean, Will it likely weigh heavily on the case or is this just a perfunctory, you know, move to get more information in there? How important is it, in other words? No, I think be, normally it wouldn't be as important as it is in this case. And it all goes back, Kathy, to what we were talking about. Because the SEC is claiming all XRP, no matter who bought it or sold it, is a security, then it implicates all these businesses. So you have a company, Ripple, there's a really good chance Ripple never heard of Tap Jets, which Tap Jets are one of the amicus that, that filed, where they're like an Uber for jets, right? You just download their app. And in order to get this jet to go cross country in an hour's notice, you have to pay immediately. You got to pay the pilot, the fuel, everything up front. Well, there's no bank open on Friday night, so they accept crypto and their number one crypto that they use is XRP. So they're letting the court know, hey, the XRP that we take, we're not buying it for investment because we turn around and, and convert it to dollars immediately. And it, But if you do what the SEC is claiming, you'll basically shut our business down. And so it's very important for the judge to know those types of things. Okay, so let me take the, this chance to ask two questions that social media users wanted you to answer. Sure. Um, a user named uh, N. Madden wants to know, will the other parties that applied for uh, Amici status get to present briefs for the court's consideration? Is it automatic, in other words, or what's the process for that? Uh, meanwhile, Duncan wants to know, what would it mean if Zago Technologies and Interhomes also file Amici briefs. So could you address that uh, briefly? Sure. 
Sure. Great question. Um, it's up to the judge. Right now, we have the Digital Chamber of Commerce. Their brief went in. And what these companies do uh, is they apply at the same time. They give a motion to the judge saying, will you accept our brief? And then they attach their brief. And so three companies have done it. The Digital Chamber of Commerce, which is the SEC didn't object to because they didn't take a position either way. And then I remit and tap jets that I already mentioned. It's really up to the judge. Um, I could see her saying that one of them has a connection to Ripple. So she's, you know, they're like a partner of Ripple. So they're not because Ripple could have um, brought that up themselves. They had access to it and allow the one that I mentioned tap jets because Ripple is completely unaware of them. Uh, but a lot of times a judge will accept Amiki outright and how much weight that judge gives each one is, you know, a guessing game. But I, I think it's important. And th the second part of that, yes, if your business is impacted, then then I think it's it's definitely worth filing. Doesn't mean it'll be granted, but um, the SEC deserves hundreds of amicus to be filed because they shouldn't be charging this case the way they have. And that's what people need to understand. It really is uh, unheard of what they've done. And, and Kathy, in 76 years, there's never been a, a, a charge like this in a securities case ever. Okay. And, and just going back to the Hinman emails, um, before I forget, one, one thing I wanted to ask you is, there are any evidence at this point that the Hinman speech was screened um, by the SEC lawyers for conflicts and approved by the SEC ethics office? I mean, is there hard evidence? I know that there's some emails that have come out, some drafts, but is there is there any proof at this point that, you know, the SEC lawyers took a look at it and said, OK, that fits with the agency's position. So go ahead and uh, do it. Or were they just looking at the emails uh, were they just looking at the draft speech and saying, OK, this is your personal opinion. So as long as it doesn't, uh, you know, you're you're not saying anything incorrect, that's fine. Well, there's no evidence that it's been screened. And the two people okay. that have been asked, Hester Peirce and the director of enforcement by Congressman Warren Davidson in Congress, he asked, was that speech screened? And the enforcement director said, I can't comment because it's in litigation. It's not in litigation, Kathy. There's nothing in litigation about whether the speech was screened or not. So my evidence that I'm telling you is I went on record to say it was not screened. When you look at all of the email, all those emails, list that are on his speech, every division of the SEC is almost included, except for the ethics division. There's no distribution of that email to them. And Kathy, I can tell your viewers real quick, a screening click check would take five minutes to figure out this conflict of interest. Right. Are you there? Uh, meaning um, that, well, they would look at the speech and say, Bill, you're giving Bitcoin and Ethereum a free pass. Do you own either one? No. Does any family members? No. What about your law firm you're still being paid from? Oh, they have a connection to the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, which only promotes Ethereum. You can't give this speech, Bill. Somebody else has to give it because of that conflict. That's how it would have went down had it been done. OK, let me ask you one last question. And this is sure. an important one. Both sides have filed for summary judgment, which some people say could speed up the end of the case. Now, I'm not a lawyer, obviously, but from talking to lawyers, I understand that the motion would only be granted um, if uh, the motion would only be granted if there aren't any issues of material fact that have to be decided. Given how contentious this lawsuit has been, it's hard to ma imagine that there aren't issues of fact and dispute here. So I guess, how likely is it that summary judgment will be granted, John? And is this just a motion, basically? Is this something that the sides, both sides, basically, have to file just in case the judge will uh, rule on it, but it's unlikely to happen? A great question. Brad Garlinghouse, I saw him interviewed, and he said that both the SEC and RIP. John, are you there? Hey, John. I think we have are having some technical difficulties. Let's uh, John dropped off. Let's 
wait for him to come back on. Hey Don, if you can hear me, I invited you to video. If you could accept the video invite. Are you there, Don? Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Um, do you want to, if you uh, see the video invite, if you could, there you go. So start over with your answer. We lost you for some reason. <laughs> uh, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, the, uh, what was the question again on the, uh... <laughs> no problem. So the question is, um, is a summary, the motion for summary judgment, oh, okay. how likely is it that this will actually happen and this case will be sped up and there'll be conclusion soon. Uh, I think the case is going to be decided as summary judgment. Uh, I changed my mind uh, before I was with you thinking there's just too many contested issues that it's likely going to go to a jury. Uh, but the as I read the SEC, and I'm going to address this in my brief, the SEC really, they haven't been able to prove any evidence that Ripple's marketing was successful, right? All they've done is said Ripple agree, agrees that they sold some XRP, but and they marketed and promoted XRP, but they have no evidence that XRP holders went out and bought XRP based on those promises that Ripple made. So uh, I become much more optimistic that that uh, that is going to be a good result for Ripple and XRP holders. Uh, is it possible that a judge could say, well, uh, whether or not XRP uh, was being used for non-investment or investment reasons? Uh, there are some factual issues. It's possible, but I would put it at no higher than 10%. Um, I almost, I was shocked, Kathy, when I read the, the SEC. I was actually proven wrong. They proved me wrong about something in this case. Before the summary judgment motion was filed, I told the XRP world and the XRP community, stand by because I predict the XRP might have some evidence against Brad and Chris and Ripple that are not public yet. And uh, it might be a couple bad days for Ripple, you know, publicly, kind of optically. And when I read the summary judgment, there was nothing there. It was just that, hey, they talked about, you know, how they want to promote the XRP ecosystem and how they, uh, they want to get XRP increased in value and things like that. And how XRP is going to be successful in the future. Everything that a Bitcoin person says, everything that Ethereum person says, everything that Charles Hodgson from Cardano says about their platform, nothing there that was unique. And as you know, there's no fraud in this case. There's no one, there's not one allegation of fraud. So this is a, a pretty straightforward case. And, and I've become more and more, I try to stay, you know, not too optimistic so I can give people uh, more objective advice, but I just don't see how the SEC wins this case at this point. I really do. I'm going to go on a limb and predict a victory for uh, Ripple and XRP holders. Well, John, thank you so much for coming on with us. Um, so many things we didn't even get a chance to touch upon. So we'll have to have you back at a time convenient for you. And we'll continue this Good conversation time. then. Thank you again, John. Thank you for everyone to everyone for watching Crypto Divine. We'll have a recap.